my name is Tony Miller. I am from Aspect Security. Uh, some of you might recognize the name. If not, go find us. We're over in that vendor area. Um, I'm the practice leader for our program services practice. What do I mean by that? I go on, I work with uh, security leaders within organizations. We talk about how to do things from a strategic level. So we all kind of understand the assessment side. We're doing all these tactical one-off assessments. I need this app tested, you know, pen tests, uh, code review, whatnot. Uh, what we're focused on in my practice is really how do we do this across an organization. So that's what we're going to kind of talk about today. I've got 11 years of experience doing this, uh, a couple different uh, consulting arms and also within a large financial services firm. Prior to that, I did my nine year stint as a developer, uh, working in C++, VB, .NET as it kind of came into play later. If you start to put this together, you'll figure out my age. Um, if you're interested, Twitter handle's up there. If you want to follow me, I will warn you I'm ridiculously dull and very inactive on Twitter, but if you want a way to get in touch with me, that's a real easy one. My email address is up there as well. You guys are welcome to email me uh, if you've got questions, anything you want to talk about related to this, or just you know talk security or whatever. I mean, I'm there for you. So what are we going to talk about today? I mentioned I work with a lot of uh, you know, management folks and so forth, and we're looking at things strategy-wise. So I want to kind of take a look at things. What do we see at that management level? But before I get started, since it's you know, right after lunch, I've got to make sure everybody's awake, we do some calisthenics. Not really. But I do need to raise a hand. So how many of you work in a development team right now? All right, so I got all the developers on this side of the room. Um, security, how many of you are with security? That's like the whole rest of the room, sweet. So, um, different perspectives. How many of you have uh, responsibility for an application pool of say 500 or better, more than 500 apps? So that's a fair number of the room. That's where the problems begin. So, for those of you who don't know, maybe you recognize the title, maybe you didn't. I borrowed the title of this from a book that I read at one time. Uh, if you haven't heard of this book before, I kind of recommend it. It's actually a pretty good, pretty good book about the way in which we're faced with so many priority zero tasks that we need to deal with on a daily basis. And it does a really good job. It addresses things from like a very storytelling approach. I won't get into the details. I'm not trying to sell the book. So. Um, I am neither of those authors, so I have no royalties coming to me if you buy it, but I do recommend it. It's a good book. As security leaders in particular, or development leaders who are looking at security, we're faced with this myriad of different things we're told we have to do. We need to go in, we need to be testing all our apps. We've got to look at these from an assessment perspective. As we just saw, how many of you had you know, 500 or better applications in your portfolio. That's a, a large number. That's very unwieldy. We're also hearing all sorts of things that we gotta be doing from secure SDLC. How do we make the SDLC more secure? Push everything left, we keep hearing. Been hearing that for years, probably over a decade now. But we're still being told we have to do more. We have to do more in the SDLC. This is terrible, we gotta get more in there. We're also told we need all these technical mitigations. I need my WAF installed. I need, you know, we need to start structuring our network differently. We need to be doing all these different technical things. I can buy all these amazing tools that they're selling over in the vendor area. I gotta go out and buy, buy, buy. It's all gonna make the world better. And if I'm in the security space, especially if I'm a security leader, I'm hearing from those above me, what do we have to be afraid of? What's out there? Are we safe or not? Are we secure or not? I just heard about this cool new vulnerability that's out there. Are, do we have to worry about that? Those are the things we're hearing about as security leaders. These are all those priorities. We've got them up in the air. Now we take those elephants and we make them even heavier. Because now we start looking at the fact that we've got these massive application portfolios. That weighs us down. There's so much, they're diverse. 
They're usually in something that size, they're spread across a large geographic range as far as who's responsible for them. That's incredibly difficult to deal with. We've also got this increased agility, or at least this push for increased agility in the development life cycle. I mean, we're here in the DevSec or DevOps sec track for a reason. Everybody's talking about DevOps. A lot of us don't even know what that means. I'm not sure there really is a definition yet for DevOps. We just know it means go faster. And that's what people are pushing for. So now you're telling me I gotta do all this stuff, I've got this huge application portfolio, and now you want me to do it faster? Okay. Lay on top of that, because that, that's not enough to deal with already, right? We've got this kind of like design du jour approach to development these days. All sorts of new layers of abstraction, different technologies are being thrown one on top of the next, on top of the next. New approaches, new technologies. I mean, you know, PHP was gonna save the world, then it was, you know, mean stack, and now we're hearing Scala and all these other things. They keep coming up, it keeps changing. So yeah, thank you, that elephant just gained 800 pounds too. But we're not done. Now you've got to stand on one leg to do all this juggling act, okay? Um, I'm sure this is not foreign to anybody, the idea of a stagnant or even sometimes decreasing budgets. Anybody? Yeah, we've seen those, right? Um, overwhelmed resources are a result. Sometimes we're understaffed. Most of the time we're understaffed if you ask the security people. Um, these are all problems. That inconsistent risk view. I can tell you last week, I was out at a client site, we're talking about massive application, moves billions of dollars a day. You ask one group, hey, what, you know, let's talk confidentiality, integrity, availability, what does it mean to you? You know, high, medium, low, what do we, you know, we went from, holy cow, it would be the end of America and the economy as we know it, if something happened to this app, to, oh yeah, we don't really even care about that app, we have other ways to do that work. That's a scary thing when we're talking about security and how do I prioritize things. And then finally, of course, there's the side, there's all this pressure we get from the business. So the business is saying, hey, you know, we need to do these things, we need to be able to get new products out there, we need, we need you to, to do this, make us secure, but um, yeah, we can't do anything to help you with that. So these are all things that lead to most CISOs looking about like that. There are days I feel like this, just working with my clients. So this is not where we want to be. So the whole point of what I'm going to talk to you about today is how do we address that? How do we take all of this stuff we got to deal with? How do we address all these applications? How do we get all these activities going, making sure they're effective, when we've got people telling us we have to do it faster and faster and faster? So we're gonna talk about a continuous approach. If you read the abstract, which I'm assuming most of you probably read a little bit of it, because that's why you're here, maybe? Or you just you saw my pretty face that looks totally different in the program. Um, you know, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but no, we are gonna talk about this continuous program approach. How do I take different pieces of an AppSec program, this big strategy of the, I'm gonna make all my apps secure, and actually play that out in a way that all those components work together. They actually enable DevOps development. They don't just work with it, but we can actually enable DevOps to be faster. And not faster because we're not requiring security or things like that, but faster in and of itself. What, what tools can we, from a security perspective, arm developers with that allow them to develop faster? And tell me there isn't a developer out there who would love to actually see that happen. Wait, you're gonna make me more secure and I can develop faster and easier? All right, I'll take that, right? So what we've done, or what I've done, is broken this down into a model. A model for applying an AppSec program across an entire organization. This model is meant to be high level enough that it can be tailored to any organization. And in reality, it can. I've done it. 
you know, work with lots of clients. This is what I do. But at the same time, specific enough that we can do something with it, it's actionable. So we're gonna talk about this. We're gonna talk about what these steps mean. We start up at the very top with application portfolio profiling. That's a big, fancy phrase. Well, maybe not so big, but it's fancy. Trust me, it is. Application portfolio profile. We got this big application portfolio. I need to understand what's there. I talked about that inconsistent risk picture. How do I actually understand what these apps mean to my business? How do I get that objectively understood, not only within my circles as a security leader, how do I get everybody else in the organization to understand it as well so they buy into the things that I'm trying to do? Once I have that in place, I can leverage that. I know the risk of all of these different applications. Now I can start to apply my assessment strategy based on that risk. I can look at a myriad of different ways I can modify that strategy to fit not only the uniqueness of my organization, the uniqueness of the applications, their risk profile, even their deployment strategies. These all come into play. That now starts to feed this other idea of secure design enablement. And this is where I start to talk about the DevOps piece. This is where it really hits the, the road here as far as how do we make DevOps move faster. We start talking about secure design enablement. And we're going to dig into that and what I mean. All of this then feeds down into, of course, we can create metrics galore. Managers love metrics, believe me. We all love pretty graphs and cool numbers that tell us all sorts of great, wonderful things. But that analysis now feeds us back into how do we refine each of these other components of the model. So we'll start with application portfolio profiling. And what we're doing here, as I said before, is we're trying to understand that whole landscape of these massive number of applications we have. We want to understand business and technical characteristics of those apps that within our organization are going to mean the most to us in terms of risk. If I'm a large financial services firm, my applications that move money are probably going to be pretty high. That's a business characteristic I need to know about. If I'm a software as a service provider, you know, maybe it's those applications that are my flagships, or maybe I'm looking at a, a myriad of internal apps versus external. We want to gather those characteristics. We want to gather the details of the app from a technical perspective as well. What's it built in? How is it exposed? Is it on the internet? You know, what types of open source software, things of that nature, are we using? All of these start to feed into potential risk. The goal of this is providing objectivity and consistency. If we can make sure objectively across all of those applications, we can provide them a risk ranking, and we can provide that to the entire organization, that's a win for us. From this, we can start to identify the basic controls needs of that application. If I know that all internet-facing applications have these necessary controls within my organization, I've now just identified that. Already we're starting to see, well, boy, that would feed into DevOps pretty nicely if I can say, hey, you know what, you're building this, here's controls you need to be thinking about. And as I said, this becomes the foundation for our assessment strategy. The components to this profiling really, again, app, defining those application characteristics that comes down to tailoring it to our organization. We need to understand what's important to us. We need to understand what isn't important to us. Generally, we try to limit that to a, a fairly small number of characteristics we're going to pull in, but we want to gather that information. We want to build a risk ranking model around this. It's got to, again, be objective. It's got to be consistent. Um, there are any myriad of ways to do that, but again, this varies by organization and what's most important to you. But we want that consistent scoring. Yes, it's very objective. And finally, again, I mentioned driving controls requirements. So what does this look like when you implement it in an organization? It can be a lot of things. 
We've implemented it as literally Excel spreadsheet questionnaires that get farmed off to people, or I've seen some organizations will actually send people out whose sole job it is to go out and sit down and do a walkthrough with an application team, look at their application, and fill out a questionnaire. Sometimes this is like new project information that we capture. Um, I've seen this implemented in Archer, where we can pull it into our GRC and, hey, you know, we're gathering all this information. So again, these are things that are tailorable about this model, but getting this profiling in place is critical. It's critical because it feeds into the rest of the model, starting with our assessment strategy and how we're going to execute our assessments. We all, we're hearing all the wonderful things out there. We know about pen testing, we know about code reviews, design reviews, threat modeling, all these are great, great things. But as most of you have probably seen, if I want to implement threat modeling and design review and code reviews and dynamic assessment across a whirlpool of 900 applications, that doesn't work. So we start looking at how do I use this risk picture I just gained to define my assessment strategy. And this isn't rocket science. There are, there are organizations, a lot of them, doing this today. We're looking at things like, what are some of the activities? Maybe my lowest risk applications don't need to go through threat modeling. My highest risk applications, they probably get the full gamut, right? What personnel, and we're gonna talk more about this later, but what personnel are responsible for conducting these activities? Low risk, maybe I've got a self-service model. I'm building things into my DevOps pipeline where you know what, we're, we're using Jenkins and it's automating all this stuff, great. But maybe for those larger apps, it's a little more key that we get a stronger approach. Maybe we require a third party or we've got a specialized test team that goes in and does these tests for us. Those are all options. Talk about the rigor, is it automated? Are we doing manual tests, things of that nature? Or if we're talking from a threat modeling, is it simply just we're identifying threats or are we digging in deeper and looking at the architecture? And then finally, the scope. Um, how often are we doing these? Are they maybe focused on just the change and what changed this time? Or do we reassess the whole application? All of this gets defined in that assessment strategy. We can tailor this. We can take this and we can tailor it to, again, what fits our organization. How do we, maybe there's, there's not that need to have everything tested every year. But how do we define that? How do we justify that? If I have an auditor or somebody who's worried, if we've got a compliance concerns and I've got folks coming in to look at it from a compliance perspective, how do I justify, I tested these five apps, I didn't test these. That's where that objective risk picture comes into play. These are the types of things we're looking at. And so weighing all that together, that becomes a part of our assessment strategy. Now, out of the execution of these, we've got lots of information. If we do threat modeling, we're starting to see, okay, here's the things we're worried about, and that if I know I've got threats, then I know kind of what controls I need, and okay, that's great. So we're gonna talk in a little bit, how do I feed that down the line? Static assessment, dynamic assessment, there's lots of great information to be captured there that's gonna help us down the line. What types of vulnerabilities are we seeing? Where do we see the most vulnerabilities? How quickly are they being addressed? And of course, design reviews. If we're doing design reviews, where are our common mistakes? So we'll talk more about analysis. I'll get into that in a little bit. So what I want to do is jump into design enablement. So we've kind of done some of these different pieces. We understand the apps. We've put some assessment work out there. We're doing all that. But None of that so far helps developers, right? In fact, a lot of times it hinders developers, does it not? You know, oh, 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 wait, you can't deploy that yet. We've got to do a pen test, and you know, it takes us four weeks to schedule a pen test, and the pen test is going to take two weeks. Does this sound familiar to anybody? I see some heads shaking over here in my developer area, so I knew it. We've been there, and from a security side, it's frustrating as all get out. 
we don't like it any better than anyone else. We're telling you, we're putting the brakes on, you guys are trying to push ahead, and we're saying no, 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 no. So how do we jump ahead? We're gathering all those wonderful app characteristics. I said we can identify basic controls requirements from that. So if I can tell you now that, okay, you filled out this thing in our magical GRC system and you answered yes here and oh here, yes here, you now need in your app these controls. Well, that's a leg up right away. I mean, even if we're not doing formal design, if I'm truly DevOps and I'm going in and I know I want to add this component of functionality and it changes this no to a yes and now that means these controls, that's easy. That's straightforward. I don't have to sit there and you know, be expected to step out of a developer's shoes and into a security guy's shoes and start to figure this all out. It's there for me. Then when we start looking at these assessment results, now we start to see how effective are we being in these controls. Do we have the right controls? Maybe we don't. Maybe the controls that we're leveraging just aren't cutting it. So as we start to see these assessment results come in, those are things that we can address. So now we see how this starts to become continuous, right? How things are starting to feed into each other. The biggest key when we talk about enabling, especially in DevOps, but also in any development, from a security perspective is this next one. How do we get into controls focused design guidance? And I'm going to talk about what I mean, because that, that, in a minute, that's a, there's a lot in there to, to pull apart. But putting something out there that developers can leverage, that gives them that straight up guidance, they don't have to go out and pull together things, or we're not expecting them to go to the web and find the latest, greatest, wonderful thing, because we know how that goes when that's, what, that's the best tool developers have. It's just, it, it's not helpful. It doesn't, it, doesn't set anybody up for success, and it can be a problem. So we're putting together this library of all this guidance that now you've given me this information about the characteristics of your app. That means you need to go take a look at these sections of the library and figure the, and pull out what you need for your design. So when we talk about that library, this is what we're talking about. How many of you out there are leveraging reference architectures? That's kind of what I thought. How many of you even know the term reference architectures when I say it? About 50%. So, yeah. What do I mean by a reference architecture? Really quick, because I don't want to get sidetracked here, but I've got a specific characteristic of an application that's common to multiple apps. Could be anything, could be at any level. But this common characteristic, when this is implemented within our organization, this is what that architecture looks like. This is how we do it. So if I'm deploying a web app, we'll go really, really simple here. Internet-facing application, it's, got, it's gonna have three tiers, we're gonna have a DMZ, blah, 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 reference architecture. We can do that at the app level as well. If I am implementing a single sign-on solution within an application, here's what that looks like. Here's the components that are a part of that. That's what I mean by reference architectures. So right there, as an organization, we've defined a very standard approach to this that now my developers can just plug into, pull that apart, and go. But we make it even better. Because we have the opportunity now to provide them with standard components. So if I'm back to that single sign-on solution, you know, maybe we're using SiteMinder. I can get as specific as, hey, this is how we're implementing SiteMinder within our organization. We can dig down even further when we start talking implementation guidance around that now, and I can start talking about exactly what cookies we're going to use, what parameters within the, the uh, SiteMinder configuration we're doing, how are we handling SiteMinder's manager, all those things. These are all bits and pieces that now pull together. This is where we take all those developers we call architects, and they start actually earning their money. They start doing the things that they've been hired to do. When architects can focus on putting this type of information together and designing this alongside security teams, and using that now to build out applications, 
Now we're driving value. Now we're getting something that is actually going to resolve issues within our organization from a security perspective and from a development perspective. Think about the consistency of development design. Yeah, I know it's, especially in DevOps, we kind of, we really like that, that glamorous thing of everybody has their own way and their own approach and that, that's celebrated, I get that. But we're talking about organizations here. We're talking about large organizations here. And there's a certain need for that consistency. So this pulls that together. Now the really cool thing in all this, anybody who's tried to implement threat modeling in their organization has probably seen it doesn't get a lot of traction. It's usually a pretty heavyweight task to implement. If I try to do it as a stage gate, that really becomes cumbersome. So what if I have this really cool reference architecture and I know it does this thing, it has this functionality, maybe single sign-on, maybe it's an authorization thing, maybe it's how do I accept user input. When I look at that, doesn't that inherently tell me exactly what threats would face this system based on its having that component? So if I've got this whole library of these different reference architectures, these different standard components, can't I now put together a pretty solid threat model with almost zero effort? Because it's already been defined. I know that if I pull this in, I now have these threats within my application. I can take that a step further and say, okay, this reference architecture represents these particular threats, therefore, these controls are needed. And oh, by the way, these five controls are a part of this reference architecture. These couple controls are external to that reference architecture and have to be addressed in a different way, hopefully by another reference architecture that's out there that you can reference. This is where things start to really roll. So I promised you something continuous. We've got all this great stuff, but it still seems kind of separate. You've seen how they start to tie together. The last piece is really this analysis and metrics. And I can't stress enough how important this is. And I know we hear a lot about metrics and we've got data coming out of every possible area of our organization and nobody knows what to do with it. So let's do something useful with it. We've got evidence that's being produced from all these activities. Each step in this model is producing information that we can use. As I said before, we've got the application portfolio profiling it's giving us excellent information about the risks of these apps. We can now define controls, we can define our assessment strategy, everything around that risk. We can justify it. So beyond just being able to say this is what I'm going to do and doing things in a certain way, I can actually go back to anybody who wants to know and I can justify exactly why I did what I did. For any auditors that might be overhearing us out in the hallway, that's a really huge thing. For you guys, it means maybe you get them off your back a little faster, which is probably good too. From the assessment strategy and execution side, I think the, the biggest piece of information there we're getting is obvious. What are the vulnerabilities? What are the design failures we're seeing? What are the common threats we're seeing? But if I take that and I tie that back to all that information about app characteristics, well, holy cow, now I can say, you know what? All these .NET apps seem to have the same vulnerability. So maybe now I go back to that scoring model in the profiler and say, wow, you know what? Anytime I see .NET, I gotta jack up that risk a little bit because we know that they're coming back with this. Or maybe there's something we need in our secure design that would address that. Maybe we're, maybe we're missing something. Is there a reference architecture we don't have? And so these people working in AngularJS are all making the same mistakes? Maybe. But that's how this all starts to flow together. It becomes continuously improving. Because now I'm refining each step by the outputs of the others, and it's all integrating together. I can take those trends, I can take those root causes, and leverage that. There's one of those happy buzzwords for you, leverage, right? So what am I looking at? I mentioned application characteristics. 
how will I adjust my risk model based on what I'm seeing related to application characteristics. It might be something as simple as, like I said before, we're seeing lots of vulnerabilities in a particular characteristic of application. Maybe it's, hey, we've become aware of new threats within a certain characteristic of an application that raises our level of risk. Maybe we see that, you know what, all our developers that are working on these financial applications are doing a really, really nice job, but the ones that are working on trade applications aren't, so maybe we adjust based on that. Again, this is, it's, it's all tailorable, right? You figure out what, it, you still have to have that organizational knowledge to make this work, but this is all able to be tailored. I can look at my common security flaws. We, we might see new elements that we need. I mentioned that already. Where do I need to beef up? Maybe, maybe there's just a control out there that's just completely inadequate. I have a reference architecture and a standard control that says, hey, use this product, and we're finding out, you know what, that product's got a lot of holes in it. All right, let's change that architecture. Let's, maybe we need to bring in new products. That's one of those things that we see a lot in vulnerability management, but it never seems to make it back. Now you've got something that ensures it actually gets action when that happens. So these are all really great. From that reference architecture perspective, we also can start to capture our utilization metrics. So now we know, hey, are there specific reference architectures that get used more often? Are there standard components that get used more often? We can start to use that information to modify our test cases in the assessment. Think about a pen test in particular. If I know that we've got this standard control and I've tested it over and over again, maybe I can reduce the test cases that focus on that. Or maybe I know I've got this other piece that we, you know, this whatever component we were using from wherever and it, man, it, you know, there's a, it's got these weird aspects to it. It can be implemented differently. Maybe now I start defining specific test cases that can better be leveraged against that to find configuration or implementation errors. Well, now my security testers are a little happier too because I've got a pretty clear path already to follow for how can I, where, where are the critical parts of this application? How do I test them? It's not saying that it's gonna give them a checklist and they're just gonna go through a test, but you've given them a lot of information that any skilled pen tester is gonna be pretty happy to have. So kind of doubling back, we've seen all this, this model. And it, it plays out, and I can, you know, I, certainly I've seen it in organizations work. It's what I, I told you, I've, we've implemented this before. But what about all those special snowflakes, you know, the DevOps people, or really anybody, why, you know, my organization is different, this won't work, we're, we're, we're special, right? Everybody is special, but maybe not. So, where does this fit in? How do we really tie it into DevOps? The biggest thing is moving to a self-service model. We hear a lot of it um, when we start talking assessments, right? How many devel DevOps developers in here? Ooh, only just a couple. DevOps right now, when we start talking about security within DevOps, we're doing a lot of very early automation on assessment work. Many times we're leveraging Jenkins to do things in our build cycles where we kick off automated tests. So that's great on the assessment side. But I just threw a lot more at you than just simple dynamic, or, or dynamic testing or static analysis. We're talking about threat modeling, we're talking about design reviews and all this. We're talking about this whole risk profile thing, right? So why can't I build that into something that's self-service? In all these models, we're registering the work somewhere. If we keep that list of characteristics that we're trying to gather small, why not capture that when we're registering this development? Wherever it's occurring, it has to occur somewhere. So let's capture that. 
an extra two minutes before you check code into a repository to populate some information. Done. Fast, easy. Talked about the automation aspect. If you're not already doing that, which I'm guessing since I didn't see too many DevOps developers, or at least people who want to stand up and say that they're DevOps, there are a lot of options out there for this. I mentioned that the most popular, the one you hear about all the time, if you go looking for DevOps security, we hear about Jenkins all the time. It's a great, great tool. It works with us. You know, Maven, leveraging it with Maven, and we ultimately end up with, hey, you know, do a build, boom, stack analysis runs. We've got our tools configured to do all sorts of great things. But that's an easy way to get that out of the hair of developers. You kind of make it self-service still. They don't have to wait on you as a security team to come to their aid and provide them with that dynamic assessment that they need in order to deploy their code. It happens just by the nature of them doing a build, by the nature of them doing a deployment. There we go. Um, the design library, I talked about this before too, what it means from a threat model perspective. When I know that I'm using a standard reference architecture and I can define the threats that face that reference architecture, just my use of it now starts to build out that threat model. Now I have a very comprehensive list of the threats to my application. I've captured all of that information. So we don't have to go back and do a specific threat model. The developers are essentially doing that themselves when they choose those reference architectures, when they implement that standard control, when they follow that design guidance. We also know specifically which controls were external that they had to work with. So now we've got a whole different approach to how we do our assessments. All of this speeds, adds speed without asking the developers to do a whole lot of anything. Out of band activities, we don't need all that results analysis to happen as part of the development cycle. That should be obvious, I think. But that's not a band activity. They're, development is doing its thing. We're letting those folks use their expertise in the ways it was meant to be used. We're letting them fly free, do what they need to do. On the security side, we're gathering these metrics and we're going back and we're doing that analysis. We're working with our architects on ways that we can improve those reference architectures. We're working with our security testers on ways to improve their testing based on what we're seeing in real life. This is no longer a guess. It's no longer, well, we, you know, we think we're seeing a lot of this or that. This is hard numbers that tell us here's places we need to focus. So now when I, as a security leader, go back to whoever my management is or my board or whoever it is that's got controls of the purse strings and I ask for money to do something, if I can put those numbers behind it and show how it's going to continue to speed up development, which means products moving to market faster, which means business people are happy, means more revenue, means we're all happy. That's a win. That's how you get, from a security perspective, less than amiable people to see your point and work with you. Now I said I was gonna tie this back to OWASP SAM as well. Um, at least I did in my, um, in my abstract. So OWASP SAM 1.5 released earlier this year. Yeah, Open SAM now became OWASP SAM if you weren't aware. Um, there's a number of requirements in there that get filled by this. So for those of you that don't know, each of these, SM3, TA3, SR2, if you're not familiar with it, those are levels of maturity in each of the practice areas. So SM refers to a practice area. Level three is the highest level of maturity. These are requirements that this model addresses within the SAM model. So you see, we got SM3 talking about uh, security expenditure and aligning that with business indicators and asset value. Well, that ties back to our risk. TA3, talking about compensating controls to each threat. Increased granularity of security requirements based on business, not, business logic and known risks. All that's coming out of that portfolio risk ranking. 
So you see, those are you know, level two and three maturity. Here's more, SA2, direct software design processes. That's our standard components. Require, require assessments and validate the artifacts. Making implementation reviews during development more accurate and efficient. Well, didn't we just do that with all these reference architectures? So again, level two and three maturity on the SAM model. The last one, ST3, requiring application-specific security testing to ensure baseline security before deployment. That's about the most basic requirement out there. But yet, this is maturity three within SAM, and it's addressed by implementing this model. So from a SAM perspective, you can see the, this type of approach. We've now elevated those, that's where we have seven of those, seven different requirements, seven different practices from the SAM model that we've now addressed with one AppSec program. The ones that aren't in there are generally more oversight and GRC related. That's why there's no applicability here. But so you've taken seven out of 12 and knocked them out. So with that, I'm gonna ask uh, if there are any questions. At this time, I'm open to them. I see, I hear crickets, maybe? Yeah, definitely. All right, well, I'm gonna take that, oh, there we go. Please. Um, if you're in a situation where you have a application release that is impacting one of those library components. Mm -hmm. Is there a specific activity in the SDLC that makes the dev architecture security revisit updating your library? Yes, so when we start talking about design reviews in particular, that's where that would come into play. So you're talking about I'm making, I'm doing some development activity that forces a change in that reference architecture? Yes. And so is it a matter of, I mean, it helped me with this scenario, we're talking about something like new technology or do you have one in mind? That yeah, it's, it's that old forget it at the end of the project and don't update the documentation kind right. of scenario. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, that's where we come to the design review component because now you're looking at, okay, I've got this application that's implemented this functionality, we know it's in this reference architecture, we look at the design, it doesn't match up. Now we, have, now we have to consider why. Is it because the developers just didn't follow the design guidance or is it like you suggested in this case, there's actually a legitimate need to change that design because it's not achieving what we need to for the developers in this particular scenario that they're trying to solution. Yep. Um, legacy. So like legacy technologies, if mm -hmm. you have like a portfolio that includes a number of applications, all these different technologies, and then you've got this whole hodgepodge of legacy technologies over here, yep. it, it makes it like, it just seems like all the ideas that I've been hearing about for automation, whether it be from Jenkins and automating scans to everything following that in the process and reference architecture, legacy technology just tends to not fit with it. Like yeah. you, you're, it, you can't fit a really a good reference architecture around a lot of the problems that like in legacy ASP or whatever that can't be solved with some of those common components. So what do you do in that to not completely, I mean, do you just document that as a gap and forget about those in the entire cycle? Or how do you treat those in a way that's effective for the people down the hall and compliance and stuff to mm -hmm. still show that your program is holistic to the entire company's applications, but not be able to fit those somehow? Sure, so what we do in that case is, first of all, I mean, reference architectures don't have to be all about standard components. Sometimes we have that and it's great. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes those are in-house developed things. But there, there's definitely that room, if we know we've got a specific set of legacy technologies out there, like you brought up ASP, which hopefully, my God, we're trying to get rid of that, right? But if it's still there, it's still there. So there are things we can do. If we know that we're gonna have continued development in that space, we can still define certain reference architectures around what those common structures are that they're going to be implementing. If you're going to implement, say, we'll go back to authentication because it's just an easy one. You know, you have, you're gonna implement authentication within a .NET app. So reference architecture can get that specific. 
Now let's say, all right, all our other apps are using SiteMinder, but for whatever reason, we can't use ASP and SiteMinder together. I don't know if that's really a limitation, but we'll just go with it. Um, now you can define, okay, well, since we can't use SiteMinder, within .NET, or within ASP specifically, here are the requirements of things that you have to do. And now here's those external controls that aren't addressed by this that have to be taken into account for. So you still have guidance for them. At the assessment strategy perspective, you can structure your assessment strategy that way as well. You can say, since we know that this is kind of its own unique animal, maybe we look at how we do assessments a little differently. Um, certainly we've seen that change with deployment. So if I've got cloud applications, I, obviously those requirements are different for how I assess them than if it's an in-house developed app. Or if I'm using some type of you know, software as a service, that's another one that's going to be different than you know, apps that we own. So all of that ties into that. Does that help? Yep. Awesome. All right. Well, I appreciate your time, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the weather and dinner tonight.